4 for the year of 2018, which created the Department of Housing and Preservation and Development Administered Housing Portal. Affordable housing in New York is a rare and precious commodity. 44% of our fellow New Yorkers are rent burdened, meaning that they pay at least 30% of their income in rent. Of those rent burdened New Yorkers, more than half are severely rent burdened, meaning that, that pay, they pay at least 50% of their income in rent. These rent burdened and severely rent burdened New Yorkers are spending so much of their income on housing that they are unable to afford routine medical care, transportation, food, and educational opportunities. In 2014, the city undertook an initiative to increase the affordable housing stock, Housing New York. A five-borough, ten-year plan sought to create or preserve 300,000 units of affordable housing. Affordable housing is created through tax abatements and exemptions, and through programs sponsored by HPD and the New York City Housing Development Corporation. Many of these housing opportunities are available through HPD's Housing Connect website, which allows applicants to search for and apply to affordable housing opportunities. The portal will also allow HPD to maintain oversight over the city's affordable housing stock by requiring owners to provide certain unit information. Today, we'll be hearing intro number 1757, sponsored by Council Member Ben Kalos. This bill makes technical amendments to the Local Law 64 housing portal, as well as amendments that exempt from inclusion certain small preservation programs and that include some unregulated properties in mixed affordable and market rate developments. Today, we'll also be hearing proposed intro 1783A, sponsored by Council Member Mark Levine. This bill excludes from inclusion in the housing portal housing cooperatives incorporated under Articles 2, 4, 5, or 11 of the private housing finance law. These, corporate in, these, cooperative in, these cooperatives include housing development fund companies. Housing development fund companies were created when the city took abandoned properties and transferred them to tenant associations for rehabilitation and subsequent ownership. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members who are here today, uh, committee member Gradenchik, Farrah Luis, uh, Ben Kalos, and Bill Perkins. And uh, we'll hear now from the sponsors of intro number 1757, I'm sorry. Um, I, I do want to make a note that um, the sponsor of 1757 is not here because he's feeling ill. 1783. 1783 is not here. I see you. I see you, Ben. Um, so we'll hear right now from the uh, sponsor of that intro, Ben Kalos. Uh, good morning. I'm Councilmember Ben Kalos. You can reach me on all social media platforms at Ben Kalos if you want to participate in the hearing. Uh, whether you're a member of the public watching at home or here in the audience or uh, watching the live stream, uh, please forward any questions, concerns, or comments, and we'll try to include it in the hearing. I want to start with a big thank you to our Housing and Buildings Committee Chair, Robert Cornegy, uh, for being a champion. And whether it's standing up on uh, third-party transfer uh, or helping on these two very important pieces of legislation, he's been a true champion uh, for those who own homes in our city and who those who seek affordable housing in our city. Uh, and I just want to thank him. We're in the midst of an... <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and, and uh, as the chair would like to interrupt me to say in the city council, if you uh, hear something you like and agree with, you, uh, it, we, we ask you to twinkle, uh, which is to raise your fingers like so uh, in a way that does not interrupt uh, the hearing. So, uh, but he did uh, I, I disavow any knowledge of it be being entitled twinkle, though. <laughs> uh, now, in, in all seriousness, we're in the midst of an affordable housing crisis in our city. More than 59,000 people woke up this morning in homeless shelters, two-thirds of which are families, and of those, uh, half of which are children. About 20,000 children woke up this morning and uh, went to a public school from a shelter. And uh, it's a symptom of the affordable housing crisis. And now many believe that the only way out of the affordable housing cri crisis is through an oversimplified understanding of economics and for supply just to exceed demand. However, as reported in yesterday's New York Times, the data shows that developers would rather leave half of every condo unit built since 1995 empty, literally thousands of apartments, rather than making them affordable for everyday New Yorkers. 
Mayor de Bill de Blasio has an ambitious plan to build or preserve 300,000 units of affordable housing, and he's brought thousands of new units onto the market. With tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers applying for each affordable housing opportunity. Your chances of being able to afford to live in this great city have to be better than literally winning a lottery. With roughly one million affordable housing units in our city, I thought we should turn our attention to existing affordable housing stock. Since 2015, we've been working with the whistleblower and hero at HPD, Mr. Stephen Warner, with the support of his union, the Organization of Staff Analysts, uh, investigative reporters at ProPublica and the Wall Street Journal, and our co-sponsor, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, to identify a possible uh, 200,000 affordable housing units where the developers were receiving up to several, up to a billion or more dollars in subsidies for units that they might have been offering uh, for non-affordable rates, even market rates. And so we sought to figure out how can we deal with uh, the fact that there's a state law that says if you have affordable housing, you have to register it. But in 1995, they got rid of any fine. So most people didn't register. This is something that Stephen Warner identified. So how do we deal with non-registration? The fact that a lot of the applications are paper and those can get lost in the mail. Uh, there were lotteries where three quarters of applicants were rejected uh, and where several investigations by the DOI on the state level, even on the city level, found corruption in waiting lists. And if that wasn't enough, there were so many different places to apply between DHCR, HPD, HDC, even individual nonprofits like Met Council had their own portals for applications. And so what we proposed and accomplished through Local Law 64 was to make it easier to find affordable housing with one place for all city subsidized affordable housing in one, in one location, being able to match residents to the correct affordable housing units by income instead of folks having to just figure out whether or not they were right for it, uh, having transparency around waiting lists and application tracking so you could see where you were in the process, and ensuring that subsidized housing was, was offered at affordable rates by requiring a registration with the state and a registration with the city, but for the city saying that if folks didn't do it for several months or years, that they would find a, face a fine per unit per month and then providing tenant protections from illegal rents and then providing public information so that advocates could make sure that things uh, were followed. Uh, in local, when we finally passed it, and I think it was one of the hardest bills I've ever negotiated, we went back and forth with the administration over 100 times. Uh, the legislation covered all affordable housing that was being subsidized from 20, January 1st, 2018, moving forward. Uh, there was a responsibility to look back to see if anything else was covered. Uh, and in the negotiations, we uh, included at the time home ownership, particularly I was at the time looking at condos and uh, things like that. I, I grew up in a cooperative. We ended up uh, inadvertently including cooperatives, particularly HDFCs. I want to thank the HDFC coalition who are here today, who are working with my office uh, on our legislation. Our legislation, we actually included a provision at the request of both the coalition and uh, HPD to exclude small buildings that were owned by only one person and they didn't have multiple buildings that they owned. So our technical amendment would include buildings with 10 or fewer units, uh, which would cover a lot of the HDFCs that are smaller. We did in wish to include the larger HDFCs, but we were actually able to, because of council rules, whoever puts in the legislative service request goes first. So we're able to work with uh, Council Mark Levine on an additional piece of legislation to provide a specific carve out for HDFCs. Uh, and it's because HDFCs are in a different, different situation than other people who have received affordable housing. Many of you did not win a lottery so much as retake a building from uh, squatters, from people using your building as drug dens, and from just really being there in the city when people were leaving and abandoning the buildings. You came in, you took over these buildings, you took responsibility for these buildings, and so we felt that you were in a very different situation than others. And so we're hoping to make sure that 
it is a lot easier for people to get affordable housing, that if somebody is overhoused, they don't feel trapped in a large apartment with large bills and large utilities just because they can't find a smaller unit. And similar people who, I, I'm in a one bedroom with a wife and baby and uh, it feels a little cramped. So we're hoping that through this system we can have a place where units start coming back on the market that exist and people can start being able to move between different units and have access to affordable housing without having to win the lottery. Uh, so I wanna thank everyone and I think the last piece is when we passed Local Law 64, the Wall Street Journal held it to be a, a huge victory, but they mentioned something that I, I didn't quite understand at the time, but I now do. When a building received a 421A subsidy, uh, there would be a certain number of units that were uh, uh, tied to the applicant's income and were rent regulated. But we also learned that there were a lot of market rate units in the building that would receive rent regulation, which meant that you might come in and start paying $3,000 or $4,000 a month, which is the market rate, but then you wouldn't have to worry about the developer being able to raise your rent by 10 or 20%, which has actually happened to me. You'd be protected by the Rent Guidelines Board's increases, which have been zero at times, uh, recently one or two percent, which for many people would be very helpful because they would be able to know that they could get in and have predictability. So I want to thank a lot of the people who worked on this. We've spent the past, pretty much as soon as we passed Local Law 64, so the first two years of my term. So I want to thank Assistant Deputy Director Megan Chen and Legislative Counsel of the Committee, Janan Zilka, uh, my Chief of Staff, Jesse Taus, and my Legislative Director, Wilfredo Lopez. And uh, I also know that uh, Housing and Buildings Chair, Robert Carnegie, has been there every step of the way along with his staff, so we are incredibly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that there'll be, if you'd like to testify today, please fill out a card with the Sergeant. We'll be sticking to a two-minute clock for all public testimony. And now we'll administer the oath to the administration before their testimony. Okay, raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions? I do, yes. Uh, thank you. So I ask that before you begin your testimony, just introduce yourself and your title for the record. So good morning, um, my name is Anne Marie Hendrickson and I am the Deputy Commissioner of HPD's Office of Asset and Property Management. I'm Margie. Bring this mic. I'm Margie Brown, I am Associate Commissioner of Housing Opportunity and Program Services at HPD. Thank you, you can begin your testimony whenever you're ready. <clears throat> good morning, Chair Cornegay and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I am Anne Marie Hendrickson, Deputy Commissioner for Asset and Property Management at the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, HPD. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on proposed amendments to the enacted Local Law 64 of 2018, Introductions 1757 and 1783. I am also joined today by Margaret Brown, Associate Commissioner for Housing Opportunity and Program Services. Affordable housing is one of the biggest concerns that New Yorkers face. Already, this administration has financed over 135,000 affordable apartments through fiscal year 2019, 57,000 of which serve very low income individuals making less than roughly 37,000 per year or 48,000 for a family of three. Housing Connect, the city's affordable housing lottery system allows New Yorkers to search for affordable housing, fill out a profile, and apply for multiple homes with a few clicks of a button. Since launching in 2013, over two million people have made accounts on Housing Connect, 1.1 million have submitted applications, and 23,000 households have, or soon will, move into new homes. Now six years after this revolutionary application was created, HPD is currently building our new and improved Housing Connect 2.0 system. House Connect 2.0 will also incorporate the changes required by Local Law 64 of 2018, the focus of today's bills. This law sponsored by Council Member Kalos not only expanded the universe of eligible homes for the city's housing lottery, but per, but per unit advertisement requirements, but placed unit advertisement requirements, or put, 
I'm sorry, unit advertising requirements in place intended to make applying for affordable housing more centralized and streamlined for the ease of New Yorkers trying to navigate the website. We have also learned a lot through operating Housing Connect over the past six years, and Housing Connect 2.0 will provide New Yorkers with a more transparent and user-friendly experience. 2.0 will automate, standardize, and streamline the application, the applicant eligibility review process with an integrated information exchange between housing developers, applicants, and HPD. The new system would also facilitate additional HP oversight and reporting on housing lottery indicators. Stakeholder engagement has been critical in crafting this system as we engage with housing developers and marketing agents, applicant advocates and service providers, financial counseling experts, several other agencies, and of course, applicants themselves. We are also working with behavioral research experts to ensure 2.0 will more easily guide users through complex questions, such as how to calculate their income and specifying what types of housing best fits their needs. As we move forward with these innovations, we are looking at every aspect of the Housing Connect system through the lens of fair housing and how we can promote equal opportunities for all New Yorkers. When the Trump administration rolled back the implementation of the affirmatively furthering fair housing requirement, the de Blasio administration launched our Where We Live in New York City process that led to the publication of the draft report published just last week. Through this work, the city has developed a draft plan to take bold, transformative action to break down barriers to opportunity and build more integrated, equitable, and inclusive neighborhoods. As part of the Where We Live New York City process, the city has undertaken an inclusive, collaborative, and comprehensive effort to better understand how fair housing challenges like segregation, discrimination, and lack of access to thriving neighborhoods impact New Yorkers' lives and how the city can take action. Since launching, HPD worked with 30 sister agencies and more than 150 stakeholder organizations to study, understand, and address patterns of residential segregation and how these patterns impact New Yorkers' access to opportunities, including job, education, safety, public transit, and positive health outcomes. With these important goals in mind, HP also updated our marketing policies that developers must follow to further limit how credit history impacts housing applicants, address and clarify complexities in income calculations, ensure special protections for survivors of domestic violence, and make the lottery selection process more efficient. These updates demonstrate the city's continued commitment to create more opportunities for all New Yorkers. HPD has also been very focused on expanding our existing outreach tools and education efforts. We currently have robust communication requirements during the marketing process, including but not limited to outreach to local community boards, elected officials, in the general public through online and print advertisements both citywide and local. Understanding that some may find applying for projects to be complicated, HPD provides resources to lottery applicants in a variety of ways. Our marketing program conducts informational seminars for potential lottery, applicants two to three, per time, three times per week to teach them about the process and also provides training for community-based service providers to do, this, to do the same. Our housing program partners with nonprofits such as Impact Brooklyn or the Mutual Housing Association of New York, MANI, and even council offices who help individuals prepare and apply for open lotteries. HPD's Ready to Rent initiative also provides free one-on-one -on -one financial counseling and assistance with affordable housing application and our resource fairs, marketing seminars, and mobile van allow us to assist New Yorkers directly in their communities. Thanks to the City Council, we've also been able to translate application guides into 17 languages. With this robust and aggressive work in mind, we appreciate the Council's shared goals to increase access to our lottery system and address issues as we work to implement the specifics of Local Law 64. For example, we are interested in discussing the removal of buildings utilizing HPD financial support for the Lead Hazard Reduction in Healthy Homes Primary Prevention Program. 
Addressing lead hazards is a top concern for both this administration and the council. And we want to make sure we are not discouraging potential users of this program, which is not intended for affordability, from utilizing this financing resource of federal dollars to reduce the risk to children. We therefore support the intent of Council Member Kalos's bill and would like to continue conversations about the specific language to ensure there are no unintended con consequences to the bill. We also support Council Member Levine's bill to remove cooperatives from the requirements of the bill, a unique and critical piece of affordable housing stock. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. We will take any questions that you may have. Thank you for uh, your very concise testimony, and I don't remember the last time the administration was in full support of some bills that we put forward. I don't even know how to proceed at this point. <laughs> But I do, I do have some questions uh, of my own before I pass this to my colleagues. Um, I'd like to start with intro 1757, uh, which is the local law to amend administrative code of the city of New York in relation to modifications to the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development's housing portal. So what's the current status of the housing portal? Sure. Um, so of course we do have a housing portal now, a Housing Connect system um, that has been up and running since 2013. The development of 2.0, um, most of it is currently in the testing phase. Um, it will be rolled out prior to the implementation date required by the bill, which is uh, July 1st of this year. Um, it will probably be rolled out about a month before, which will give us some runway to get projects actually into the system before the implementation date of the bill. Thank you. How many units do you expect to be included in the portal once it's completed? Sure. So um, some of the uh, the um, changes that we're um, talking about, there is some language, there is some ambiguity in um, a few pieces of the language that we um, want to work with council to understand the full intent. Um, there's actually a big, a pretty big swing factor in the number of units that would be required based on um, understanding that intent better. Um, and so once we have that, uh, the finalized version, and um, fully understand um, the council's intent of the bill, we'll be able to provide a better um, uh, response in terms of exact number of units. So is, is the administration aware of the concerns that tenants have had about the current iteration of the portal? Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the, um, uh, the great things about uh, the fact that we engage in communities two to three times a week on our marketing program and have the Housing Ambassadors program, which is uh, about 50 not-for-profit organizations that both help applicants apply, but also are really our eyes and ears and feedback to us. We have um, bi-monthly uh, meetings with them to really hear applicants' concerns. Um, and so we, it is a great way to get feedback. We also have a, a direct hotline to our marketing program um, and take um, calls to that every single day. So uh, just to go off script for a second and not to, not to throw too many curveballs, but I know in my office and in the office of my colleagues, we get so many questions around uh, the portal, the use of the portal. I'm wondering how you're capturing information about people's concerns around the portal and is there a, a, a clearinghouse to help us, like we all, I'd love to have that in my office, like some kind of a virtual suggestion box that we could use from, from, from tenants who are coming to our offices and then we have to disseminate the information and then pass it, pass it on. Is there a direct way possible in the new iteration of the portal to include um, feedback of some sort? Um, so we do, the, the portal does have a, um, a way just to kind of email HPD and let us know. We currently have an email address that is posted on Housing Connect, so um, people know how to reach us um, by email as well as by phone, but the new system will kind of uh, incorporate that into the system. Um, what would you say the response time to a concerned uh, potential tenant would be? from HVD? Um, so it really depends on the type of concern um, uh, and, and the way that um, somebody submits it. So for if somebody calls our hotline, we have people manning that hotline during all business hours. Um, and so they usually get picked up immediately. Um, it, with regard to a question um, that comes into the email, um, partly it depends on the nature of that. If it is a very like nitty gritty question regarding 
um, and application, often we need to kind of gather information before we address it. Um, but certain things we um, respond to immediately. Um, there's some t uh, particularly questions about um, either technical difficulty or just questions on how to use the system. Um, we, uh, we get back to very quickly. I know oftentimes we uh, have hearings where we question particular industries on their level of customer service as we advocate for our constituencies. Sure. Uh, I'm going to do that a little bit, not here today, but in uh, a continual fashion with the administration, in particular HPD, to have at least their virtual customer service meet the needs of its clients. Because when it, quite frankly, when it doesn't, um, my office and the office of my colleagues are inundated with questions that not we don't necessarily, as not being HPD, and, and there's a level of advocacy that we wind up having to do that is not even advocacy around getting a, a unit, it's advocacy around accessing the information and or having a direct relationship with HPD. So I'd like to suggest, although it's not uh, stated in these particular pieces of legislation, the opportunity to work hand in hand with the administration, HPD in particular, to increase the level of customer service so that we can increase the level of customer service as council members who are on the front line. Absolutely. So, so with, with, with that being said, I'm going to pass, um, uh, let some of my colleagues ask questions because I know that there are uh, several hearings happening simultaneously. So who we have? Oh, so Councilmember Kalos, whose bill we're discussing here today. Yeah. Uh, thank you again to the chair. Great questions. Uh, I have four questions, but okay, thank you. Uh, as mentioned in my opening, when Local Law 64 passed, the Wall Street Journal noted that the law did not include market rate units in mixed income buildings, which are not income restricted, but still rent regulated. Intro 1757 will require these units to be registered with the city. Uh, how many units are we talking about? Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I do not have that figure um, with me today, but I can get back to you on that. Okay, I think based on our analysis, it may be hundreds of thousands, uh, but we will get a firm answer. The next one is, following law, local law 64, HPD raised concern that small buildings with 10 or fewer units uh, that weren't owned by, by under common ownerships, receiving subsidies might be forced into registration and offering units, which could be burdens, and we agreed and we're exempting those under introduction 1757. How many buildings and units are we talking about in this universe? Um, I'm sorry, I think that I, I need to get back to you with that number as well. No worries. I think when I, we discussed, we were talking about hundreds or thousands, but very low, and yes. then I think thousands of units, but uh, I think you had you'd mentioned some of the programs being like folks who needed help with energy retrofits, uh, and that was not, we want to encourage people to do those mm -hmm. without adding. Uh, and so, also as mentioned in my opening, HDFC and other affordable housing cooperatives are uniquely situated, intro 1783, of which I am a co-prime sponsor, would exclude the HDFCs and other uh, cooperatives. Do you know how many HDFCs have more than 10 units and how many homeownership opportunities would be excluded? So, Councilman, every question you're asking will require us to just go back and just finalize some numbers for you. because No worries, those, okay. okay. So, uh, I, we already have been talking about it, so I understand wanting to have firm numbers on the record. Mm -hmm. So I guess the part that we've gotten the most questions about is when we passed Local Law 64, we kind of defined a universe and said, let's get everyone into one place uh, and make sure everyone's registering with you so we know what the universe looks like. And uh, I imagine whatever you come back to us with, hopefully on the record, hopefully before the record closes in 72 hours, will probably end up being inaccurate because when the system goes online, you'll actually get all the registrations. Uh, so I guess the, the question is, uh, we said define the universe and then we kicked it to you to say, okay, how is it gonna work? So I think folks are, we, we've now all seen these things I mentioned in my opening, like hundreds of thousands of people apply for 10 units. Um, how would the system work? Uh, and the thing I'm most interested in is re-rentals. So if you're a building owner and you're watching at home and you've got 11 units or you've got 100 units and you've got two units that are coming online for June 1st and you're saying, oh my God, I'm gonna get 100,000 people applying for this, how is the system gonna work? Yes, absolutely. So um, in developing the system, we really recognize the need to have a, a different process other than an open advertised lottery for re-rental units as they come online. 
Um, we don't want to compromise the, um, the cash flow of buildings. And so we recognize that it needed to be a really immediate process. And so how the system will work for re-rentals is that as developers submit the required registration information, the system saves that information. And so it has the specifications of units. And so if a developer goes into the system and says, unit 2B in this building is available, the system automatically knows that's a two-bedroom unit, it knows the um, address of the building, um, it knows the square footage, um, all things that um, go into an applicant deciding whether they would want to live there. And then rather than holding an open lottery for it, the system will automatically pull a, what we like to think of as a mini lottery of applicants, 10 to 20 applicants, depending on kind of how hot the housing opportunity is. Um, and it will match applicants based on not only their eligibility information, but also certain housing choices that they put in their um, application. And so applicants can specify, I'm really interested in a two bedroom unit. Um, they can specify neighborhoods that they might be interested in and other um, factors like disability needs um, that help to determine whether a housing opportunity is right for a particular applicant. As that unit becomes available, um, the system will uh, random, randomly select the 10 to 20 applicants that match all of those specifications, and the system will automatically reach out to them and uh, say, hey, you've come up for, um, as a candidate for this housing opportunity, are you interested? If you are interested, submit your documents through the system now. Um, if, you know, uh, five out of 10 of those applicants respond, the, um, the developer will move forward with the application process with those five applicants um, and then make a offer of housing in log order, in mini log order, um, to the, the lowest log number applicant there. Okay, Okay. so just to be clear for all these re-rentals, it's not gonna be a situation of an avalanche. They will get a number of applicants, they'll have a chance to screen those applicants. Folks will be pre-matched based on what they said, and then because they'll already have their financial income in, you'll have a situation where folks will be getting five to 10 pre-qualified, bona fide. Well, I, I believe in the real estate industry, people have to pay a lot of money to get those leads and even often have to pay a broker a, a fee of at least now under state law a month uh, just for that service. Uh, so I'm hoping both of our bills pass as soon as possible, uh, and so, um, HDFCs would be exempt, other folks would also. Um, would people be allowed to opt in if they heard what you had to say today and they were like, wow, I could save like, in my district, $5,000 for the month and in other districts, uh, perhaps different amounts? Sure, so the, um, the current portal is being built to um, really around affordable properties and built um, uh, particularly to um, come into compliance with the law. Um, but uh, one requirement of the law is that we do a study to determine whether non-affordable units, um, non-HPD units, um, can be handled through the system and exactly how those would be handled. Um, and so uh, we are focused now on rolling out the initial version of the system, but we'll absolutely be coming back with that study. So, uh, and just to be clear, the law as written focuses on New, new affordable housing units uh, from July, January 1st, 2018, but if, if I'm an affordable housing developer and I have a unit from 1990, from a 1990 regulatory agreement that hasn't expired, and I say, you know, I'd like to use this instead of having to pay a manager, uh, I've actually had the chance to look at a budget, and, and I think 20% of the budget goes towards dealing with marketing, re-rentals, and so, something like that, so they could actually pull that out of their budget if they were using your service, so could, could an existing affordable housing developer or administrator use your service? Um, yes, if, uh, if the property is affordable and um, not necessarily subject to the marketing handbook or the law, but um, does want to come through the system, it could accommodate that. And do we know how many apartments we will likely see becoming vacant every month or per year? Uh, so again, that depends on um, at some of the um, technical um, language of the law and understanding the exact intent. 
Um, but in general, we see um, about a um, of the stock that we monitor and know, we see between a two and three percent turnover rate in affordable housing. So that is probably the the rate of turnover that we would see in buildings. That is amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you to the chair and to the members of this committee for their indulgence. We've been joined by uh, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, and she has a question. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for your work, and Deputy Commissioner. I know you've you've been doing this for a long time, and I appreciate uh, your commitment. Your testimony covered Housing Connect and the ambassador program. When I worked as a housing counselor, I was one of the ambassadors, so I know it has, in fact, come a long way since it first launched. And the Where We Live program was currently in the Lower East Side, so I thank you for trying to make those rounds. I want to ask specifically about HDFC rentals. The bill as it stands uh, covers cooperatives and in my district and in, in districts across the city, there are many HDFC rentals that we want to ask how they can be potentially cut out or incorporated in a more efficient way going forward. Do you know how many HDFC rentals there are citywide? Um, Good morning, Councilmember, and thank you for the question. Um, I don't have that particular stat in front of me, but I definitely could provide you with the HDFC rentals that HPD has been involved with form formation and has regulatory agreements under their, under their guise. I ask because the HDFC rental units that are managed by nonprofits in my community, for example, are more than willing to go forward with the new regulatory agreement and, and work with HPD with the marketing expenses that they incur with all of these kinds of factors, but I want to make sure that we are not adding anything too cumbersome or onerous on nonprofits that are already really trying to manage a significant portfolio of truly affordable housing. So can HPD think of any reason why HDFC rental units should not be cut out of LL64 under similar circumstances as the HDFC co-ops as proposed in intro 1783A? Um, I, I think that we would need to um, look at the exact universe that it is and um, and how they um, are similar or different from the um, the universe of buildings that would be subject to the law um, and uh, but would be happy to engage with you on that. I have uh, HDFC rental units and cooperatives directly connected to a community land trust in my district. And as you may have noticed from the last budget cycle, we put forward a new initiative to really expand community land trust, which I think is a great model. Does HPD support the CLT model and does it believe that applying these housing portal rules to these kinds of models will inhibit their expansion? Um, I think uh, in terms of, we, we, we'll, we support the CLT model and I think what we are doing right now is further exploring how that model can be replicated. Um, right now the experience with HDF, with the CLT model is pretty limited. Um, I only really know of one being the Cooper Square model, okay, which has been a good model. Um, however, it is something we are definitely supportive of. We're doing a little bit more um, exploring about how it would work and how it can be replicated throughout the city. Um, in terms of why maybe it shouldn't come through the portal, again, I think we need to take a look at that a little closer to see what the governing pieces of it are to see how it would affect if they came through the portal because we're not looking to restrict, you know, we're looking to accelerate and expand, okay, the opportunities for all New Yorkers to be able to get into affordable housing. Yes, I, I would encourage you. There's going to be um, some individuals test testifying today, specifically from Cooper Square Mutual Housing, and I think they'd be a great ally. I know you're already working with them very, very closely. Yep. Uh, I, I'm pretty much done with my questions. I just want to say that I do think that we should further expand the, the cutouts and in intro uh, 1783A to include all CLTs and CLT-connected projects that meet the definition of CLTs enshrined in Local Law 67. I think it's important um, because of their mission, because of what they've been successful in achieving, and I look forward to working with you on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you. Um, so I just want to go back to a few questions <clears throat> that I had um, before we move on to the public testimony. On proposed intro 1783, 
How many units would be excluded by this bill? Um, so I can tell you the universe of units that are excluded from the bill. Um, uh, one of those, um, and I, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the units, there are certain units that are currently excluded from the existing version of the law, and then there are units that are um, excluded through the new, um, through the new amendments and the new um, Levine bill. Um, so under the current version of the law, um, dwelling units that are currently subject to um, a referral process, a government referral process, are subject to the law, uh, are, are not subject to the law. Um, also, dwelling units with um, inconsistent regulatory requirements from either a state or federal body are also not subject to the law. Um, uh, based on the um, proposed amend amendments, um, of course, the um, HDFCs, um, as well as other types of cooperatives, would be removed. Um, again, I think we need to get back to you with exact numbers on that. Um, and then, of course, um, based on the new amendments as well, um, small buildings with less than uh, with ten or less units um, that uh, are owned by a um, landlord that does not own other properties are also excluded. So, so to me, that was just a tad bit um, confusing, but I will <laughs> I will visit back because really, I, I, I want to do the best I can for tenants to understand what tools they have in a city that's becoming increasingly unaffordable. Um, so. I got to find a better way to get that explanation out of you. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be rude, but it was very confusing to me as a council member, as the chair who kind of does this all day. I can't imagine what um, a tenant may be feeling in hearing that response. While I appreciate and respect the response, it was quite technical in its in your response, and it's very difficult for me. I think that the high level. Um, uh, um, Top, kind of top line is that most um, uh, rentals and re-rentals will that are um, are newly created or have um, were previously created and are still under a regulatory or tax regulatory agreement or tax exemption will be included in the portal. Included will be included. I'm sorry, so let me, let me drill down just a little further to see if I can get some clarity. Absent this exemption, exemption, I'm sorry, absent this exception, would HDFC cooperatives be included in this bill? Um, under the current uh, version of the law, HDFC um, cooperatives are in it, but based on the exemption that was proposed, they would be removed. Would vacant units be required to go through the housing lottery? Vacant units in HDFC cooperatives? Yes. Um, no, they would not. How are vacant F HDFC units currently filled? Um, so the uh, bylaws of a cooperative um, uh, create um, standardized evaluation criteria to um, evaluate new ap applicants um, to the cooperative. What, what is that criteria, if you could share it for the record? Um, so the, uh, the criteria vary from um, co-op to co-op. Um, it is based on the bylaws. So it, 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 it literally varies co-op to co-op? Um, uh, yes, the, there, um, certainly there are the regulatory um, uh, income restrictions that are based on being an HDFC. I, I feel like my colleague Ben Kalos is uh, chomping at the bit over here. Did you have something? Nothing? Okay. Okay. Do you think HDF HDFC should be required to be listed on the portal? Um, so the, uh, the current amendment, which we support, does remove them from um, uh, both the requirement to rent, or, or I'm sorry, to sell through the portal, um, as well as the um, reporting requirements. Do you think that vacant, vacant HDFC units should be required to go through the housing lottery? Um, so where we create a new HDFC cooperative um, that um, is, uh, um, has received new financing um, from HPD, those units do go through Housing Connect, or um, currently are subject to lottery and will go through the new system um, uh, if they have newly received financing. 
So I gotta ask, and I know this is probably gonna drive you crazy, but do you think that there's some retroactive for existing HDFCs that would benefit tenants by having them included in the portal as well? And I know it's a, it's a double question, because I asked the question earlier, but in light of the fact that we are, we've recognized the importance moving forward uh, with, um, with new HDFCs, I'm just curious as to what you think about the necessity for perhaps uh, revisiting existing HDFCs. Um, Council Member, it's a good question. Um, I think what we'd like to think about for the HDFC co-ops, as, as you know and as you propose, you know, we've been looking at, we have our TPT working group, and we've been using that working group um, as a vehicle, okay, with your leadership and, Co and Commissioner Carroll, to hear feedback from our HDFC community. Um, you know, we know that we have challenges. We know we want to support, um, provide additional support. So I think that's something we would want to talk with our, with our um, external parties about, whether they think there's some ad advantages to coming through the portal. Um, at this point, because again, there's a cost to that, okay? And I think we want to be mindful of cost, okay, as it impacts, you know, low-income co-ops, low- and middle-income co-ops, let me say. So that wasn't me as a mask advocacy for it. I just wanted to know what your opinion yeah. is around it. Yeah. Um, with HDFCs that do not have very regulatory agreements, but, the, but that they avail themselves, the DAP tax cap currently be included in the portal? At this point, um, again, with the amendment proposed, none of the HDFC co-ops, okay, particularly the affordable ones that have come through HPD's um, programs, are expected to be part of the housing portal. Got it. Uh, and just lastly, uh, ab absent this exception, would limited divided housing company units be required to go through the housing lottery? Are you, are you you're familiar with that classification, yeah. Yeah. correct? Yeah. Limited ones. Yeah, I mean, again, outside, I mean, with the amendment that's being proposed, those would also be excluded. So my last question, as it always is in, uh, in this particular instance, is uh, does HPD support intro 1783, but you were clear in stating up front that you did. So um, I could have probably <laughs> done away with the hearing in its entirety because you supported it, but we have to go through the process, so. Uh, uh, thank you. If there are no more questions from my colleagues, we can move to the first public panel. Thank you for your, um, your, your testimony thank and, you. and questions. Thank you. So we're going to call the first panel. Um, is, uh, uh, this looks like Michael Palm Palmeo? Palma. Palma. Okay. Sorry. Got it. Yes. yes. April Tyler. Tina De Feliciantonio. It's a lot of syllables, but I made it, I think. Uh, John McBride. When you've, when you've settled in, you can begin your testimonies. Um, we are asking that two minutes on the clock for your testimony. You. you can do it however you like. Thank you very much. Uh, press, you gotta press that button for me, though. And I just ask before you begin your testimony if you can identify yourself for the record. Okay, my name is Michael Palma. I'm one of the founders of the HDFC Coalition. I'll also introduce myself in my testimony. Oh, I'm, I'm April Tyler. I'm also a founding member of the HDFC Coalition, and I am also the co-chair of the Housing, Land Use, and Zoning Committee of Community Board 9 in Manhattan. Hi, I'm Tina DeFelice Antonio, well, a newbie compared to these guys with the HDFC Coalition, and I live on uh, West 26th Street. Good morning, my name is John McBride. Uh, I'm a member of the HGFC Coalition. I've been involved with the HGFC Coalition since uh, the 90s with the late Jordi Reyes Montblanc. Some of you may remember him, thank you. So please begin your testimony and just remember be mindful that there are several panels. 
Um, and if you could keep your testimony to two minutes, we, we would appreciate it. Sure thing. Uh, thank you, Council Member Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings for the opportunity to testify in support of intro number 1783A, which would provide a much needed amendment to Local Law 64 by excluding HDFC cooperatives from HDF, HPD's housing portal. My name is Michael Palma. I am seated here with April Tyler, John McBride, Tina Di Feliciano of the HDFC Coalition's Policy Committee. On behalf of the HDFC Coalition and the 30,000 families who live in 1,200 HDFCs, we would like to express our strong and emphatic support for intro 1783A. The HDFC uh, Coalition has been and remains ever vigilant when city or state policy is developed for HDFCs, especially when well-meaning legislation has adverse unintended consequences for HDFC co-ops and their shareholders. The HDFC Coalition began its advocacy work in 1992 28 years later, we continue our efforts to assist HDFC shareholders in preserving and protecting their homes. We work with city, state, elected officials, community boards, and HDFCs throughout the city, primarily in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, where the majority of HDFCs are situated. Through our collective efforts, we have been successful in preserving HDFC affordable home ownership by securing HDFCs an exemption from tax lien sales in 1994, successfully advocating for state-sponsored tax forgiveness in early 2000, saving distressed HDFCs from foreclosure both in the past and the present, objecting to third-party transfer program as it devolved into a land grab instead of being used as a mechanism to turn buildings abandoned by landlords into HDFC cooperatives, helping to protect New York City's watershed supply, water supply by fighting against the sale of land around our watershed. And more recently, HDFC Coalition has mounted advocacy efforts to prevent HPD from imposing onerous and impractical one-size-fits-all regulatory agreement. We crafted a counterproposal to HPD's proposed R R R RA, and we are submitting it for the record. Additionally, we worked with pro bono attorney Steve Siegel to draft badly needed changes to update the state's 1960s era private housing finance law to ensure the continued via viability of the 1,200 HDFC co-ops. Now, HDFC homeowners, which I see a lot here today, are faced with yet another threat uh, to their survival and their right to self-determination by the enactment of uh, Local Law 64. Um, we're pleased to, sorry, we're pleased to hear that uh, there seems to be general support for exempting HDFCs, but I will re quickly read this statement anyway. Um, it's important to note that Local Law 64 was intended to crack down on sophisticated developers receiving 421A and J51 tax breaks who were not registering their affordable e rental units as being rent stabilized with the New York State Housing Homes and Community Renewal Agency. However, as it's now written, Local Law 64 requires every single HDFC shareholder to comply with onerous provisions or face fines amounting to tens of thousands of dollars potentially. We need to remember that these HDFC co-op apartments are privately owned homes, not public housing, and should be treated as, as such. HDFC home ownership is in danger of diminishing if individual homeowners and HDFC co-ops are forced to comply with burdensome, confusing, impractical, and counterproductive obligations imposed by Local Law 64. Local Law 64 presently requires HPD to create a housing portal, um, which will, which as um, had been stated, is a massive government database, and um, each individually owned HDFC co-op apartment would be required to be listed on that portal. Um, and in each year, HDFC homeowners would be legally compelled to comply with requirements that are not only burdensome, but also constitute a gross invasion of privacy by demanding substantial personal information be posted on the portal. In addition, if their apartment becomes available for sublease or sale, every single HDFC shareholder is required to to post this information on the website. 
The practical difficulties and burdens created by this were summarized by um, our HPD's Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner Anne Marie Henriksen in um, council hearings in 2016, and you can read her direct statements um, at your leisure. And I ended exactly on time. <laughs> That, that, I just want to say for the record, that's an awesome example to set for the rest of the panels. <laughs> Good job. Um, uh, again, I'm Tina DeFelice Antonio. Um, as an example, a homeowner who is unable to ap reply in a timely fashion to prospective buyers may be sued or fined with substantial penalties. The demands imposed on thousands of people include penalties of up to $2,000 a month that will need to be paid by low and middle income owners, retirees, the elderly, and those on fixed incomes, which can give rise to fiscal instability for both individuals and the co-op. Keep in mind that the severity of these fees were originally aimed at real estate developers of rental buildings who were skirting the law, not private homeowners. Also keep in mind that those without access to computers, those without technical prowess, those who are limited due to disability, and those for whom English is a second language will likely be unable to comply with the demands imposed by Local Law 64. It's a virtual certainty that a homeowner's obligation to respond to as many as hundreds of individual applications for one unit will cause widespread confusion and anxiety amongst our most valuable or, and vulnerable of citizens. Inexplicably, nothing in Local Law 64 anticipated, let alone addresses any of these complex issues, which may inevitably result in widespread involuntary noncompliance. While developers may view financial penalties as part of the cost of doing business, the imposition of those fees are exorbitant for those who can least afford them. It is imperative for Local Law 64 to be amended by enacting number 1783A so that the intent of this law is absolutely clear, that is to regulate developers on the housing portal, not private co-ops. Thank you. I'm just gonna continue and finish the statement, thank you. Uh, indeed, HPD itself has acknowledged through the previous testimony of its deputy commissioner in 2016 that these concerns are not susceptible to resolution um, through rulemaking and are intrinsic to the law itself. We share HPD's expressed view that the obligations imposed by Local Law 64 on individual homeowners are overly burdensome, confusing, impractical, and counterproductive. To those very grave concerns, we had another that in all likelihood was also unanticipated. The onerous obligations imposed on HTFCs as detailed by HPD's Deputy Commissioner may have a chilling effect on the ability of eligible lower and moderate income New Yorkers to actually buy a home in an HTFC cooperative. More specifically, due to compliance and liability issues, lenders may limit their support and in some cases even withdraw from the HTFC marketplace for share loans. This means that potential homeowners who need to rely on financing would essentially be shut out of home ownership. Instead, those with resources to, to pay cash only would end up being the primary purchasers of HTFC apartments. In its present form, Local Law 64 will have the perverse and unintended effect of making home buying less affordable to the very people who are intended to benefit from the HDFC program, namely hardworking New Yorkers of low and moderate income. <clears throat> Accordingly, the HDFC Coalition supports Council Member Mark Levine's Intro 1783-A to limit the applicability of Local Law 64 to landlords and developments of rental building, landlords and developers of rental buildings, and to fully exempt HDFC private individual homeowners from the onerous obligations imposed by Local Law 64 of 2018. I'd like to thank the, or we would like to thank the bill's sponsors and co-sponsors. Uh, Levine, Kalos, Cornegy, Rosenthal, Rivera, Rodriguez, Cohen, Chin, and Yeager. Um, thank you for your time and attention. We are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your testimony, and wow. Excellent. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, thank you for your support. I, I, don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any questions, but I do just want to state 
uh, that your advocacy, the coalition's advocacy around this has driven legislation on, on our level and has driven me to be more astute as it relates to the le relationship between third party transfer and HDFCs, um, as well as this topic. So I just want to personally thank you. Well, we want to thank the council and we appreciate all you're doing for housing and uh, we've seen a lot going on uh, that you've been trying to assist people who are victims or potential victims of deed theft too. So we, we support ho individual home, home ownership all across the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for following the instructions correctly. I happen to know for a fact that the coalition is a, could be a, a rather rowdy crowd. So th thank, you for thank you for following along. I'm gonna call the next panel now. Um, Glory Ann Kirstein. Sorry, Victor Romero. Uh, Mary Beth O'Hara. Shaliva Tomlitz Merchinson. And De Deanara Del Rio. Um, I have to be excused for a moment. Um, ben Kalos will be sitting in in my absence. You know you got one of the best with Ben, so just please excuse me. I do want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Mark Jonai and Helen Rosenthal uh, for joining us today. Thank you. You may begin. I'm Gloria Ann Hussey Kirstein. I'm a member of the HDFC Coalition, both its steering committee and its anti foreclosure committee, which is fighting the TPT program. I have lived in my HDFC for 37 years in Manhattan Valley on the Upper West Side. I'm here to address three points. Uh, the first one is thanks to a, a fellow employee when I worked at HPD for 26 years, Steve Werner, who took it upon himself to do his own research and revealed that over 50,000 units of affordable rental housing that were created through massive tax breaks to rich developers were not being registered with rent stabilization. A quick thanks then follows to Mr. Kalos, Council Member Ben Kalos, who picked up on this very valuable research that was printed in ProPublica and decided to craft legislation that would correct the wrong of these rentals not being protected through rent stabilization. So thanks to both my fellow employee at HPD, Steve Werner, and Mr. Kalos for uh, trying to correct this. The second thing I'd like to address is just to tell the story about my HDFC. I, my HDFC is 15 units in an old law tenement five-story walk-up. The majority of the HDFC shareholders in my building are Dominican immigrants. And as a matter of fact, that is typical of most HDFCs. Out of the 1,247 HDFC co-ops throughout the city, 817 have 20 or less units. I, 364 have 10 or less units. What this means is that we are very, very small, and the majority of such small HDFCs are self-managed. That means the entire burden of the building, all the maintenance, all the repairs, all the paperwork, fall on a small group of shareholders who are on the board. And that is why in my building, for example, eight out of the 15 shareholders don't have computers. Six out of the 15 households do not speak English. One third of the households are senior citizens of advanced age. That probably includes me being 71. So this is just giving you a schematic based on one HDFC that is typical of most HDFC co-ops that were never meant to be targeted by this law that was supposed to go after those developers who were misusing their tax breaks in order to get out from under, since there are no longer fines if you don't register, get out from under the rent stabilization law. So thirdly, of course, I'm here today, both as an individual shareholder uh, in my building for 37 years, as well as a member of the HDFC Coalition, to thank and support Council Member Levine, 
for his groundbreaking amendment, 1783-A, to protect HGFC co-ops, and also to thank the co-sponsors, Mr. Kalos, Helen Rosenthal, and others for supporting that same amendment. Thank you. Great example, continue. Good morning, council members. I'm a member of the HDFC Coalition and the East Village Chapter. We shareholders as part of the urban homesteading program in the 1980s dedicated nine plus years of our lives to the complete gut renovation of one of many abandoned city-owned buildings. These buildings were a sore reminder of a city that had almost gone into bankruptcy, a city of landlords that abandoned thousands of buildings all around New York City, creating a blight that could be seen on every block in our neighborhood. Many of these buildings were used as shooting galleries. They were dangerous for many reasons. The East Village had lost its community. There was no tax revenue coming in on any of these buildings. We shareholders contributed our own money to buy tools and rent many dumpsters. We put in sweat equity doing development work, completing demolition, pointing the bricks, digging the subfloors, and took out loans to be able to hire professional contractors to put in all new building systems and renovate these units. All we wanted was a home and the security a home brings. We wanted to stay here in our beloved city and build on our future. The loans that paid for the renovations have been repaid in full by our co-op and expired 14 and and we fulfilled the requirement of our regulatory agreement with the city, which expired 14 years ago. During the 36 year history with our building and over 28 years since we've received our CFO and have occupied the building, we have taken great care to responsibly maintain our home and remain financially healthy through our own hard work and resources. Doing so brought new business and people back to the East Village. In 2012, we ourselves paid for a complete roof replacement. Given the history of our building and many other healthy HDFCs, including us in Local Law 64 would be a violation of our co-op and shareholders' rights as homeowners. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Victor Maurice Romero. I'm a member of the HDFC Coalition and the Foreclosure Committee and a check of a tax franchise, a financial services company that is offering free pro bono work to HDFC. I am here to support proposed intro 783A, uh, a local law that will exclude HDFC from the housing portal. I also request that local law 64 be amended in its current form to ensure that all HDFC's costs are not participating of the poor because of the financial burden that it imposes on them. It may be appropriate for uh, Local Law 64 to apply to developers who receive huge tax incentives, as it, as it was said before, of over a, million, a billion dollars in the city of New York. They have staff, they have financials, stability to be able to cope with the financial issues and the burden that impose Local Law 64 in the current form. Local Law 64 would place a huge financial burden to a small HDFC imposing penalty, forcing them to spend money by hiring marketing consultants, developing a marketing plan, advertising in local circulation newspaper like the New York Times, hiring translators and holding community forums and sending mailings out. These are some of the burdens that Local Law 64 imposes currently. And this is one of the reasons why we ask the council to support Interest 783A. Our company conducted a survey of HDFCs and what, it will have, what, what they will have to do, they will have to comply with Local Law 64 in its current form. For example, this survey indicated that a typical building, a small HDFC, as described by Glory, which is a reality of all the HDFCs in the city, COPS, will have to have a financial burden to, to market one or two units of about $42,000. Because why? And just let me just, uh, we, we, to conclude. We, we hear you very clearly if you can wrap up. Thank you. To conclude, it is not fair for them to use the financial resources that they need to support the building 
suspended on hiring consultant in complying with all the stringent requirements with a checklist of having to fulfill 60 items of the housing portal that, is, that will be required in the local law 64. This is the reason why we support intro 783A. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Council. My name is Shilavia Thomas Murchison. I do support the initiative 1783A uh, for all the reasons already mentioned. Um, today I'm here to testify about my HDFC, which is to 248 Madison Street HDFC. I have a petition here that I would like to put forward to the Council today. Um, I'm actually sending it to the Department of Justice. What we want to um, make clear here is that we as HDFCs feel like we were targeted. Um, by developers and their um, development partners. What I'm asking for specifically is that our reps be held accountable for not protecting us and for not doing what they were needed to do before we were put into this because not only were the properties taken, people were harmed by this. So this petition that I have before me now, I have over 200 signatures here. We're going for at least 2,000 signatures to send to the Department of Justice. This is going to the United States Department of Justice um, Attorney General William Barr, 950 Pennsylvania Avenue. We the people demand that a special prosecutor be appointed to any state case involving third party transfer and deed theft in the state of New York. We the people demand that a special prosecutor be appointed to file felony murder charges on City Council Representative Robert E. Cornicky Jr. for the murder of Margaret Blow and the subsequent death of her husband 28 days later. We the people demand that a special prosecutor be appointed to file felony murder charges on City Council Representative Robert E. Cornicky Jr. for the murder of Margaret Blow, the owner of the property targeted by the representative in his third party transfer development. Margaret Blow is the owner of a property targeted by the city council member and his development colleagues since 1995. Margaret Blow is the property owner was targeted by the city member by the city council member and his colleagues through an aggressive housing push known as the Affordable Housing Third Party Transfer Program. Margaret Blow was 54 years old in good health and she was the mother of seven children. My mother's body was found on Fulton Street in Nostrand on April the 1st, 2011. One more sentence and later died of heart failure as she bled out from her injuries to, to, from an injury to her face. My mother, Margaret Blow, refused to sign over her property or sign agreements to transfer her property and died as a result of the aggressive harassment from the development colleagues, colleagues of Robert Cornicky Jr. So we're asking this now to come down from the federal government. We already have a third, uh, uh, actually a, a state case in, in um, court now. Um, attorney Nicholson, she is my attorney, and we're asking for a special prosecutor to be attached to any third party transfer deed theft for the fraud cases. Um, particularly, in particular, we're asking for a federal prosecutor to come in because our highest prosecutor is, is Latita James. And we, at this time, we feel there's a conflict of interest, and we could not ask her to um, prosecute um, fellow members or former members of colleagues in which she have sat with before. So that's why we're asking the federal government to actually send a special prosecutor so it is not burdensome on her as our highest prosecutor here in the state of New York. So I, I appreciate you guys for your time. We do appreciate you guys giving back the properties or exempting us from those properties with there. You guys must understand not coming to meetings, missing meetings, um, staffers not doing their jobs, those things, you have these districts in your hand and you also have lives in your hand, and we trusted our families with the people we vote into office. So it's not a, um, a option whether or not you show up to important hearings that say whether or not these people will lose their livelihood. You have to stop that. You have to stop all the in fighting amongst yourselves, and you also have to make sure that you're doing the job. In order for my council member to say it was not humanly possible for him to visit all of the properties that were put on that list says that it was not humanly possible for those people to come out, your constituents, and vote. So I appreciate your time, council. Appreciate you. Thank you. We're very sorry for your loss. I'd like to excuse this panel and call our final panel. If you haven't already signed up, please fill out a slip of paper up front. Uh, David Powell, uh, Cooper Square, MHA. Uh, Martha Danziger, representing herself. Beth C. Mills, uh, representing 1346 Park Avenue Park Place HDFC. And Carol Corden, New Destiny Housing. 
Should we slide down? Good morning, committee chair, um, Cornegain members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding proposed amendments to Local Law 64. Um, I'm t my name is Dayanira Del Rio. I'm the co-director of New Economy Project. We're a co-founder and member of the New York City Community Land Initiative, or NICELY, the alliance um, on whose behalf I'm submitting testimony today. Um, NICELY is an alliance of more than 30 organizations citywide that are working to advance community land trusts and community controlled development in New York City's five boroughs. Our members include existing and emerging CLTs in all five boroughs that are working to create and preserve deeply and permanently affordable housing, both cooperative and other home ownership models, as well as deeply affordable and permanently affordable rental housing, co affordable commercial space for local small businesses and other critical community needs. Nicely supports the council's efforts to expand access to affordable housing, especially for New Yorkers who are low, very low, and extremely low income, and those experiencing or at risk of homelessness. We understand that the intent of Local Law 64 is to hold accountable developers and landlords that receive public subsidies and ensure that New Yorkers can fairly and efficiently apply for affordable housing. We support these aims as well as the appropriate exemptions to Local Law 64 in order to prevent adverse and unintended consequences for certain affordable housing providers, including CLTs and nonprofit developers in our coalition. We urge City Council to exempt from Local Law 64 and the housing portal requirements community land trusts as defined in New York City's administrative code and properties on CLT land. We also support broadening uh, intro 1783A to exempt both cooperative and rental HDFCs. Um, a little bit of background on CLTs. Um, we are com CLTs are community-led nonprofits that own and steward land for the public good. CLTs lease use of the land they own for affordable housing and other critical community needs, typically through 99-year renewable leases that establish affordability, resale, and other restrictions. In recent years, City Council has supported um, CLTs in recognition of their ability to preserve and protect public subsidy, affordable housing, and combat displacement. I just want to um, note that there are two specific issues uh, regarding Local Law 64 that affect CLTs. First of all, the cost prohibitive requirements that the law would impose on CLTs, which you've heard about, like other nonprofit and community-based affordable housing providers, CLTs have very limited budgets, already have annual reporting requirements, and um, would be burdened to the, ex you know, to the extent they would have to comply with Local Law 64, and this would Im impede and hinder their ability to provide deeply and permanently affordable housing. Secondly, um, the requirements would undermine CLT's ability to prioritize housing for and combat displacement of existing and uh, longtime community residents, which are a core part of CLT's mission. Communities are organizing CLTs throughout the city thanks to city council members' support. Um, we especially want to thank council member Rivera for her championing of CLTs, the Progressive Caucus, and the council at large. Um, they're organizing precisely to combat displacement of longtime neighborhood residents and to support community members in planning for their neighborhood's long-term stability. And so we believe it's important as community-governed and community-accountable institutions that CLTs have the ability to, um, to provide for mobility within the community for their members and stakeholders. Um, I'll leave it at that, and thank you for your time. Hello. Okay. Uh, my name is Dave Powell. I'm the executive director of the Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association on the Lower East Side. I'm the only uh, member of our organization or co-op uh, testifying today, so I just want to ask the other shareholders of Cooper Square MHA if they could please stand and just make their presence known to this body. Thank you. You're, and uh, like many of the people who have testified here today, um, you're looking at you know people who have been in their community, in some cases three and four generations, and really fought to keep it a community when the city turned its back on us. So. 
We want to just honor that commitment of everybody in this room who's been a part of that movement. Um, I want to just let you know, and for those who don't know, as you know, Day has mentioned the, the impact of the local law 64 while well-intentioned on community land trusts. We are the first and perhaps only existent community land trust existed or, uh, connected organization. We are a mutual housing association of 21 buildings. We are, that is a federated HDFC, so we are an H HDFC co-op. Uh, we also manage an additional four buildings that are HDFCs, three of which are HDFC rentals. And I just want to echo um, both my colleague uh, Day's uh, you know, pitch for and our council member Carlina Rivera's question about um, uh, HDFC rentals and, and request for the council uh, that a cutout be uh, orchestrated for them as well. Um, intro uh, 1783A would cut us out of local law 64 and I do appreciate that and, and want to acknowledge that. However, our, you know, the other rentals, uh, HDFCs that we manage would be left behind and I do want to um, again make that pitch. Um, Similarly, I want to echo the thought that um, CLT connected projects, all of the existent or burgeoning CLTs at the moment are HDFCs, so HD, you know, existing, exempting all HDFCs including rentals would get us probably there. But since this council is thinking about CLTs in the future, um, I want to suggest that there should be, as Day has said, uh, a cutout specifically for CLTs. Um, and lastly, I do want to draw the attention of this body to something that is not uh, relegated necessarily to Local Law 64, but I think comes into really clear focus when you uh, log on to the housing portal. And that is, if you do, um, many of us who live in HDFCs live in walk-ups uh, uh, without elevators. Every, uh, all 21 of our buildings in the MHA co-op, for example, are, are walk-ups. Um, if you go on the housing portal, you'll notice that there is a, under the eligibility requirement, and this is attached to my testimony, there is a specific um, piece that says that shareholders are not allowed to apply for HPD supported housing through the portal. Now, um, for organizations like ours and HDFCs that co-ops that are under resale restrictions, um, there's no good reason for this. Um, we, our people bought in at the original, you know, $250 price. We are resale restricted to sell at that price, notwithstanding the consumer price index, right? So um, this is not a private co-op, right, that people are selling, and many HDFCs also have resale restrictions, although probably none is quite as deep as that. So I want to just point out that for those of our residents that are aging in place in our community or who are mobility challenged, the inability for an HDFC shareholder to apply for affordable housing through Housing Connect or other means is effectively a housing accessibility issue and may not, you know, may actually put the city out of compliance with the ADA. Um, and I just want to urge the council to revisit that issue. Again, it's beyond the scope necessarily of just Local Law 64. Uh, if HPD was still here, I would, I would bring that issue to them. I did buttonhole Emory Hendrickson in the hallway, but I want to ask the city council to work to, to correct that, um, uh, what I think is a glaring omission in the city's policy. Thank you. Hello, my name is Martha Danziger, and I live at 52 East 1st Street in East Village, and uh, it's a small, um, old building, and a five-fly walk-up, and I uh, would like to thank first the coalition for all they've done to protect our buildings. And I'd also uh, say, like to say that um, the, while I understand the whole point of Local Law 64, and I'm in a neighborhood where you see new, new high rises all the time, and it is very important that if um, people are given the right to build a building and have an obligation to uh, house some afford provide some affordable housing, they absolutely uh, should be made to do it. And it is a very good idea that um, it will be made more public and made, made more available to the public. Um, I also would, of course, be in favor of the two proposed uh, uh, um, uh, amendments, and I thank both Council Member Rivera and Council Member Chin for supporting these. And um, I want to just point out, and Victor p mentioned the fact that it would be cost a small building, it's cost anybody, anybody in HDFC about 42000 to go meet all the obligations, all the requirements of the local law 64. And, um, as someone who's been in this local, this small self-managed building for over 30 years, um, anything over 10 grand, 
throws us. Uh, and and as it, because it's an old building, um, old buildings have lots of <laughs> problems. They, you know, these things you did not expect suddenly happen, and, and there's not a lot of uh, money waiting around. It usually involves a mortgage or a, an assessment. So um, it's just, I just want to add that one point, and that is that these are buildings that were repaired, and they may seem like they're very valuable now, but they're old buildings that need a lot of attention, and an additional requirement that could cost the co-op is, is unfair, and I appreciate the fact that the City Council is considering um, the change, and I agree that um, the uh, Community Land Trust should be considered as well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carol Corden, and I'm the executive director of New Destiny Housing, a 25-year-old nonprofit committed to ending the cycle of domestic violence and homelessness by connecting families to safe, permanent housing and services. We're testifying because of our concern about the unintended consequences of Local Law 64 for very low-income survivors of domestic violence. New Destiny, New Destiny currently operates a rapid rehousing program called Housing Link in partnership with the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence and its five family justice centers. Housing Link connects victims with vacant re-rental units managed by New York City's affordable housing providers. Case managers at the Family Justice Centers, which is administered by the Mayor's Office, refer victims requesting help to the on-site Housing Link staff. And under the program, 108 families have moved to safe, affordable housing, helping them avoid shelter or shorten their shelter stays. This unique rapid rehousing program is based on a HUD best practice that has been successfully implemented in other parts of the country for victims who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. The success of this program relies upon strong relationships with affordable housing owners and managers. Local Law 64 will require all city-financed affordable housing re-rentals to go through the Housing Connect portal and lottery. Survivors forced to flee domestic violence will no longer have rapid access to safe, affordable housing. New Destiny recognizes that Local Law 64 was not intended to further marginalize very low-income survivors of domestic violence. And therefore, we are asking that the law be amended to explicitly include the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence under the exemption for direct referrals from a government agency or instrumentality. Currently, the law allows for units that will be filled by direct referral from a government agency or instrumentality to bypass the lottery system and receive applicants directly from that referral source. The mayor's office, through its family justice centers, is the referral source for survivors of domestic violence and should be included in this exemption. This change will permit Housing Link to continue rehousing very low-income victims who are homeless or at risk of homelessness because of domestic violence. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I welcome any questions you may have. Good morning, council members. Um, my name is Beth Mills, and I'm the board president of 1346 Park Place HDFC located in Brooklyn, New York. The 1346 Park Place HDFC is not in favor of the LL64 local law that requires lotteries and publication of HDFC unit availability as, benefic as beneficial to HDFCs. We are vetted property owners who have long proven that we are more than capable of managing our existing properties. We have stood the test of challenge and meager to non-existing support from any source except our dogged self-reliance in the face of what to do and how. There are endless stories of courage, bravery, and determination that are the cornerstone of our HDFCs. Our HDFCs are still standing in an absolute habitable and managed way. This was no small feat. HDFCs are each uniquely different and have been shaped by the experiences and circumstances of the HDFC community. We are by no means one size fits all, but we are united by the very familiar struggle that began this journey. In the end, we understand the need for self-determination, ownership, and the home to call our own. We require assistance at this very moment that I speak. 
However, with any assistance offered or pondered, we the people of our HDFCs must be absolutely included in the decision-making process and how it is executed. The question is, will the assistance be to the overall greater good that will ensure the future of HDFC property ownership and its collective culture? Or will this ownership be in the constant threat of political wrecking ball decisions? As HDFC gatekeepers, it is our collective e effort to be included in a most significant and meaningful way in the making of all laws and decisions that will protect the interests and sustainability of our HDFCs. It is more than necessary, it is a right. We are here today to exercise that right in our show of support for Councilman Mark Levine's proposal bill 1783A, respectfully submitted, Beth C. Mills. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge you've been joined by Council Member Margaret Chin. We will have a quick round of questions. Uh, first up is Carlina Rivera. I will follow her. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here and for testifying. Um, really, really appreciate all of you. So I, I want, actually this question I guess is for David and some of your work at, at Cooper Square Mutual Housing um, Association. I know with, with the other HDFC uh, tenants and, and shareholders, how $10,000 can make a very, very, very big difference in your infrastructure costs. And to even nonprofits like yours, David, where $40,000 is actually a very big deal and that's just for marketing. So you mentioned in your testimony some of the challenges that you're facing with the rules, the citywide rules that HPD would apply to affordable housing developments that would affect you. One, one thing you just mentioned, for example, was community preference. Are, are there other challenges? Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking. Um, I mean, one of them, and this, again, if HPD was still here, I'd ask them and would really ask the council to help us you know, understand this issue. But the, the issue around community preference um, has had a, a interesting impact on the conversations we're having with them in trying to uh, negotiate a new regulatory agreement. So right now, for example, uh, like I think most HDFCs, um, most of our vacant apartments, when we get a vacancy here or there, we have internal transfers. Um, we have for people who are overcrowded, they might be living on a top floor, and we might want to try and checkerboard them down to a lower floor, et cetera, et cetera. There's two ways that we do this. Both of them are enshrined in our co-op's offering plan. One of them is a straight transfer, right, where you take a full household and you would move them, let's say, from a one-bedroom to a two-bedroom. The other is a so-called additional apartment request, where you would take that same household, but let's say it's two generations and the younger generation is starting a family of their own. Under our current rules, we can offer that younger generation or that um, able-bodied generation a, an apartment of their own. It's an internal transfer. Um, and what HPD has told us is that um, because of community preference, but also impacted somewhat by Local Law 64, because that's where these apartments would go, they would have to be marketed now on, on the portal, that we would no longer be able to offer additional apartments to that second or third, or in some cases, fourth generation um, of our residents who are now overcrowded and need their own apartment. Um, so uh, this is something that's been a real challenge that we have had as a kind of business issue we've been a little stuck on in our, in our regulatory agreement um, with HPD. We're currently negotiating a construction loan through the Green Housing Preservation Program. But you know, when our shareholders um, became shareholders and voted to become a co-op and voted to become a mutual housing association affiliated with the CLT, they understood the, the practices enshrined in their offering plan to be what they were signing up for. And now it seems that um, HPD, um, possibly through its own rulemaking, although possibly through Local Law 64, we're not entirely sure, ha is stepping on that. And again, we're asking for the council to help us uphold the additional apartment um, uh, provision that we have in our co-op offering plan. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I realize um, how these rules could affect kind of your internal operations and, and everything that you have to deal with. And, and thank you for, for all of your work on this issue. And Mr. Chair, thank you for allowing me to ask the question. Thank you, Carlina Rivera, for your championing of CLTs and for your work for all HDFCs in our district. And thank you, Council Member Chin, likewise, for your work on the HDFC and CLT issue in our district. Uh, thank you for those, that question. Uh, 
in the council, we, we, we wiggle our fingers to applaud and we would like to applaud. We are joined by PS309, the George E. Wibbekan Preparatory Academy in New York City District School located 794 Monroe Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11221. Thank you for joining us in the city council. This is your home, this is the people's house. And uh, folks uh, your age can actually introduce and, and, uh, and pass legislation into law. Uh, so we uh, welcome you and uh, we are just wrapping up a hearing but we will uh, continue. I just have a question and then we'll go to council member uh, Helen Rosenthal. Uh, I guess uh, first, I, I recently was looking at an affordable housing co-op in my district and it had a, a 20 to $40,000 annual set aside included in the maintenance for management costs to do with managing possible uh, uh, remarketing and, and what have you. And so um, this, this material provided by Victor Morissette Romero is incredibly helpful because uh, I did not realize that they were asking you for 60 different documents just to, uh, to uh, sell your, your, your home. That is a little bit beyond the pale. And I think uh, the, the hope was that you would just be able to use information the government already had and be able to just put something up like on Street Easy and that it would be that straightforward. And my, my goal is, is to actually save you the 10, 20, 30, $40,000. Uh, so many of you are going to get carved out, but there'll still be an option if you wish. Um, what are some things we can cut out of this 60 item marketing package and what have you? Please confine it to just like 30 seconds to a minute if possible, but like this seems a little bit long and ridiculous. Are you, are you directing that to anybody in particular? Well, I think multiple of you brought up the same remarketing issue too. Do you want to speak to that? If, if, I don't know what the list is. It's okay. Don't, don't. I mean, I will say I think the exemption in and of itself is, 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 is helpful, right? So if, so if HDFCs are exempted, then, you know, the marketing checklist that you're talking about um, will not be something that we have to deal with, right? So, so um, I do, I do want to say, you know, in the case of Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association, we, we do have an annual asset management submission to the city, right, which includes all of our admissions. We do have um, nine years of practice for, we have an admissions committee, which is ma mostly made up of shareholders that live in the co-op. Um, and in fact, we do, in, we have our own costs for our own admissions process, even without Housing Connect. So I just want to sort of say that there are organizations out there and even standalone HTFCs that have cultivated um, admissions processes, uh, th and I think that, that that should be preserved as much as possible. Uh, and I guess for new, new Destiny, if I recall in the legislation, which is 15 pages, so it is, we, we put in specifics because uh, there are certain housing units where there is preference if somebody is in a shelter, uh, if a person is a victim uh, or survivor of domestic violence, uh, if a person is HIV positive, if a person is an artist, uh, and we wanted to make sure that that would be reflected and that people would be able to move forward. And then if somebody ever saw on the waiting list that somebody got ahead of them, they could say, oh, I understand this person has this status, so I understand why they would go ahead of me on this list. Uh, so so my, I guess from the initial legislation, uh, our, our belief is this would not impact access for uh, survivors of domestic violence to gain access to affordable housing and that even in the HPD regulatory process that that would be even further clarified. So I, I think one of the issues is that this is a rapid rehousing program and so we're actually trying to prevent survivors who are fleeing domestic violence from having to go into shelter and we also are trying to get them linked to housing quickly to avoid the impact both on the survivor but also on the children that they very frequently bring with them when they flee domestic violence. So the idea is really to reduce trauma, to reduce the impact of the shelter system. And to do that, having direct access to those affordable units is really critical because they're good quality, they're affordable, they're rent stabilized, and therefore sustainable over time. 
So going through the whole process will really lengthen that process and essentially you know, undermine a program which has been very successfully done in conjunction with the mayor's office. Uh, so again, to clarify, my understanding is working with HPD, the regulations that they've been drafting would not force domestic violence victims out of a rapid rehousing. Is that your understanding? That is our hope. So, <laughs> so yes, it, I know we have spoken with HPD and they seem to be supportive of this. Okay. Um, rapid rehousing is a HUD best practice and would be one way that survivors could avoid becoming homeless. Yeah. I, I, I agreed. So uh, just to be clear, uh, a lot of things can be handled through the regulatory framework and I believe we're trying to solve for your specific issue through the regulatory framework. If as part of the regulatory framework, you are not able to be addressed. We are committed to working with you to any specific exemption. I want to keep survivors from being in any way homeless, if possible. Thank you very much. We My appreciate pleasure. the council's support. I'd like to hand it over to council member uh, Rosenthal to, I think, maybe close out. Well, I just wanted to uh, thank you, um, council member Kalos. I wanted to thank um, New Destiny for coming today and testifying. Um, you know, while I do think that HPD may be writing something into uh, the rulemaking, um, what I've asked council to do is look into explicitly uh, in the law, noting the, that NGBV should be part of it or, or however the language is to make sure it's very clear that there are exemptions for domestic violence survivors. I appreciate your noticing it and coming here to testify and um, just wanted to get on the record the importance of making sure that survivors are exempt from any burden um, so that the rapid response can go forward. I mean, if anything, you know, the, the severe lack of affordable housing and even shelters um, in terms of rapid response for survivors is, uh, has been a frustration. Um, and certainly the requirement that, you know, survivors leave the DV shelter and possibly have to enter just regular homeless shelters um, is concerning. You know, we need to keep them in some sort of uh, protected location longer um, and make sure that they get into, you know, safe, secure, affordable housing. So thank you for that. Um, Day, I also just wanted to thank you for coming and, um, and your testimony on Community Land Trust. Uh, I, and again, I just wanna confirm that um, I think it's 1783, a accommodates what you're asking for here. So there's um, two things. One is that our understanding of 1783A is that it would only exempt cooperative HDFCs, and we're asking for an expanded definition to include rental HDFCs. Uh, got it. Um, and we want to, our understanding, you know, there are, so there is the Cooper Square CLT, there are other incorporated CLTs, and there are many more that are taking root. Our understanding is that most will be incorporated as HD, under HDFC law, but we think that it would make sense to explicitly include the carve out for CLTs, which um, the city council defined a few years ago um, in legislation in, in actually defining CLTs in the administrative code. So if we could request an exemption for CLTs and properties on CLT land, we think that that would just ensure that CLTs, which obviously are not the intended target of local law 64, aren't um, inadvertently harmed. Okay, so a similar issue as with domestic violence survivors in the law itself, noting the car out, not waiting for HPD in rulemaking. Okay, thank you That's for that. Correct. Yes. Okay, and then um, I want to raise an issue. Really, anyone's free to answer, but a, a deep concern I have is that um, you know. Uh, people who are students with parents who, uh, who have significant funds who sort of, 
you know, land in some of these HEFCs and shouldn't really be there. Um, what are the protections against that happening? Is that partially the ongoing requirement to, you know, for people to show income? Um, but how do we get around this? I mean, I would say resale restrictions are always part of that picture, right? Because whenever you, you know, if, if you have an income restriction, but you're selling an apartment for $200,000, right? So that's when you have that trust fund kid coming, you know, with cash in hand, boxing out the rest of New York. Um, I think also, you know, and this actually uh, intersects a little bit with, you know, domestic uh, violence survivor referrals. One of the issues that we're having, again, w with HPD in, in negotiating our regulatory agreement is um, we currently can take direct referrals from community-based organizations that are trying to keep residents in our community uh, from being displaced from the community. So people who are facing eviction, people who are fleeing domestic violence, and these, by the way, may or may not be organizations that are specifically, uh, usually they're, they're tenant advocacy groups like Cooper Square Committee, Goals, um, social service organizations like University Settlement in our area. Right now we have the ability um, to accept direct referrals um, based on need and what we're being told, again, in part, uh, we're not so sure exactly where HPD's fear of the community preference lawsuit, you know, ends and local law 64 begins, but we're mm. basically being told that that is being scrubbed out, right? So when you put our people, you know, intergenerational Lower East Side residents in competition with the rest of the city, in competition with, you know, coming up with, you know, a, a spotless credit report, you know, hitting deadlines, being computer literate, having English as a first language, right? You start to see who gets into this housing. And it, it will be, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the, in, the intent of the law, I think, is terrific, you know, from the, from the consumer side. But I think exactly to your point, council member, we have to be sure that we don't privilege those who are um, most in a position to, you know, use a system and present as an ideal candidate, right? And I think that, um, again, allowing for, I'm gonna make a pitch for our own e existent admissions process, we, we, have, we have a place for direct referrals for people who are shelter bound um, who are, or who are fleeing, uh, fleeing domestic violence or who are um, the victims of natural or man-made disasters, the Second Avenue gas explosion. Yep. We took in um, you know, 10 of those residents, nine of them are shareholders today with us. Some of them are here today, actually. Um, so, you know, a, a, and that was actually working with Anne Marie Hendrickson and HPD. Funny enough, HPD still wants to reserve the right to make direct referrals themselves, but they don't want us to be able to take them from local tenant advocacy organizations, social service organizations, and so on. So it's a little um, dicey and a little difficult for us to, again, preserve intergenerational legacy for our housing for the people who most deserve it if we don't have the ability and the autonomy um, to make those kind of you know, direct ha emergency housing referrals, or receive, rather, those direct emergency housing referrals. And this, again, very much cuts into the CLT model, which relies on local governance and local accountability. So are you saying that that should be explicit in the law to make, uh, to have priorities? Um, we would love to see that. Um, again, you know, if you if you speak with HPD, they will say that this is this has to do with the community preference issue. The strange thing, and I've not found anybody who can explain this to me, is my understanding is that that lawsuit hasn't been settled yet, and yet it seems that HPD is sort of running scared and setting policy based on like kind of hedging their bets. And so again, like within their portfolio, I don't know where that begins and ends. Is it just the HDFCs and the CLTs and the MHAs that are subjected to this? Or is it like, are they, you know, for new development, you know, across the city or in 8020s, are they also scrubbing out community preference? I, 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 you know, we have to ask them directly. Okay. But yes, having it, having it legislated would be better than having it, to your point, than having HPD write the rules and interpret it on their own. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Yeah. Seeing no further. Testimony, no further questions. I want to thank all the advocates who are here for uh, what turned out to be a, a 
longer than average hearing. Thank you, thank you for sharing your expertise, working with us on this legislation, and uh, working with us to cover even more housing so that we can make it a lot easier for every New Yorker to get affordable housing. So it's a little bit more than winning the lottery, but folks will actually be able to get access to about two to three percent of all the existing affordable housing in our city. I think that could be a huge, big game changer. Thank you, I hereby adjourn this hearing. Right. <laughs> no, we can go to lunch. That was good. Thank you. 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 Thank